So, I'm just going to start by shaking things a little bit in the music industry. <laughs> um, so, David Bowie, Bjork, and the Beatles. What do they have in common? They actually reinvented the way that they portrayed themselves to the world. And they never got satisfied with the good enough. They always looked at themselves and asked a very key question, which is, what if? What if, as David Bowie, I killed Ziggy Stardust? What if I created a whole new album for uh, my new music, uh, which is all based on VR? that Bjork did last year? What if we uh, turn out not to be the good boys anymore and became the psychedelics, as Beatles did? So these guys, they were never satisfied with the status quo. They were always challenging themselves, their music, and the things they, do, they were created. Boston Studios was created in 2010. Uh, and in that moment, there was a massive revolution in the games industry. If you guys know a little bit about how uh, the games industry works, it was traditionally you would have developers creating games and you would have publishers publishing the games or the consoles actually helping to publish the games as well, which means that they would do all the marketing and they would connect to the audiences. But what happened in 2010, around that, that time, was that two things happened that changed a lot of the way the games were created and marketed. And one of them was Unity, and the second one was Facebook. So with Unity, uh, game designers and game developers were now uh, able to create games in their bedrooms and have something playable in a very, very quick way. And with Facebook, as you know, it's like people were actually being able to connect with others and spend hours in a platform and, uh, and engaging with others, but also engaging with games. And those two big things kind of resulted in games like social games, which are the farm views of this world. So your, your, your mom, your uncle, my sister, everyone was telling me, OK, let, I'm building my little farm in Farmville or I'm blowing up some candies in Candy Crush. Candy Crush was already very big on Facebook before I became to mobile. Uh, and it was, a, it was a time where everyone was kind of challenging and asking ourselves, are the publishers and are the consoles still that relevant? Because as games developers, we can go direct to consumers and we can actually engage with them. <coughs> and for us, it was, I mean, I talk about us because it's me and my two co-founders. We were working in very large organizations and marketing products. And, you know, I, I worked in, in, in television before back in Brazil. I worked in Nokia here in, uh, in the UK. And, and we were marketing and creating games. And we were asking ourselves, what does that mean for the whole creative machine of games? Is there a way that we can reinvent the creative machine of games, of creating games, not only from a, from a delivery perspective, but from concept to execution and to marketing? And we left our jobs of kind of very good and secure and highly paid jobs. And uh, we ventured into creating Bossa Studios. And we asked those questions to ourselves. What if, right? What if we created a game studios that actually uh, was inside the largest platform out there, where people are spending millions, well, not millions, but you know, many minutes per month, uh, as opposed to going to PlayStation, where they're spending less time per month. Uh, what if we created games that actually connected directly with the audiences as we're creating them? And what if we created like a very good and transparent monetization that allowed people not just to buy uh, virtual goods, their little farms that sometimes are not that connected to the gameplay, but uh, a very transparent monetization where they would 
buy things in game that actually had direct impact on the gameplay. Um, oops, I'm going too fast here. So, in the first year of Bossa, it was such a massive ride, right? Because we we were like you know five people in a very tiny space in a circus space here in Shoreditch, and and then we built a company of 20 people in just one year. And that was possible because instead of going through the traditional uh, seed stage, VC, whatever, we actually got acquired by a company called Shine Group. And Shine Group, I don't know if you guys know, do you, do you know Shine Group at all? Yes, no, yeah? So Shine Group was set up by Elizabeth Murdoch, uh, who's the daughter of Rupert Mur Murdoch. And she's actually one of the smartest women in business I ever met. And she, uh, she decided that she wanted to acquire a games company because that was very important for television to learn how interactive entertainment would work. And so it was, it was an amazing ride for us because like, yeah, let's, let's join forces here. You guys have IPs like uh, MasterChef that we could tap into, big audiences. <coughs> Uh, but also there's money in the bank for us to you know, create a company from scratch. And we were 20 people after a year, and we also launched our game Monster Mind, uh, first game on Facebook after a year. And as if things were not getting you know, good enough, that happened. So we won a BAFTA award for our first game after 18 months that we had started our company. And it was like thrilling moment, right? We were like over the moon, amazing, let's continue to do that. But not so much. Because most of mind actually was a financial disaster. So creatively we were like amazing, we're doing great, BAFTA, da da da, recognition. Financial wise, nothing. Like literally we had created a flop. And um, it was a very tough moment for us to go to this realization. But also there was a huge pressure for us to create something that would actually make money. And uh, I think, I would say that probably there was the darkest times for us at Bossa because we went in such a you know, big high and suddenly we were like, oh my God, do we, are we really, can we really do that? Can we pull this off? A lot of questions about everything and high turnover in the company and you know, uh, in terms of employee engagement. And so we found ourselves actually uh, trying to spend money to create games that would make money in the short term, as opposed to the long vision that we had in the beginning. And that, that was actually worse, right? Because it's worst you can do is just look at short term and say, okay, we need to make money now. How do we do that? And then panic mode and et cetera. So we did a lot of side projects with large uh, advertising companies uh, in, uh, in, in London to kind of keep ourselves kind of afloating. And we actually realized that we were not uh, connecting to our beliefs anymore because we were doing just for the sake of the money but not for the sake of revolutionizing the, the creative industry that we wanted to do. And so I had a... I don't know if you guys watched the, the Apprentice. <laughs> this is a place where the losing team go, and it's very depressing because you know it's it's entertainment, right? So it needs to be very depressing that they lost the task, and they go to the bridge cafe to talk about the horrible things they, they did during the task. So at the time, shortage was not that gentrified. So my co-founders and I went to this type of cafe. We spent a day there, uh, very emotional day. Like, okay, we need the cost of going down. Money's running out, what are we going to do? It's like, what is our plan A or what is our plan, plan B, plan C? We need to figure out how to get out of this, this situation. And, and again, we kind of realized something very, very important, which is the mindset of, of the entrepreneur and the mindset of making great things and great products, which is we were not connected to our beliefs anymore. We were not uh, totally vested in to continuously change the status quo. Uh, we kind of became boring, right? So it's like, yeah, we, we got probably a little bit irrelevant and boring. And after, that was like beginning of January. And every, I think usually mid-end of January, there's, a, there's a, an event called Global <coughs> Game Jam. And Global Game Jam is basically a bunch of games developers going to big warehouses all over the world 
and they spend a whole weekend there, 48 hours literally, they just don't sleep, uh, to create a new game. And it's a massive, you know, worldwide competition because everyone wants to make a, an amazing game to show to the world after the Global Game Jam. So we said to ourselves, okay, Game Jam is coming right now. Uh, why don't we select our four best people and send to them, see if they can create an amazing game. And, you know, maybe, maybe we get lucky there. Um, and we, we sat with them and said, look, there's an opportunity here. Why don't you guys go there and nail it, see, see what happens. And we did that. And that was during the weekend. Uh, on Monday morning, I remember that I sat on my desk and I started to play Surgeon Simulator. And I was like, oh my god. Uh, and I don't know if I have a. Yeah, okay. I can't, I'm not sure if I can play that video, but I'll play in a minute. Do you guys know Surgeon Simulator at all? Yes, okay. So, yay, okay. So I sat on my desk and I started to play this. I was like, oh my god, we're going down. <laughs> That's over. It's like, it's so gory. Actually, people removing organs from... If you, if, you, if you cannot deal with gory, just don't look at this for, for a minute. I'm just going to try to play here. And there's some swear word as well. Here. Uh, let's see. Oh, is it not going to play? Oh, no. Okay. No? Okay, media not found. Uh, it's on YouTube. Yeah. It's, it's on YouTube. Yeah. It's on YouTube. The thing is, I need to. It's it was just small. Just embedded. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, Don't worry. Yeah. We can. I can show it to you later. Yeah. It's it's very nice. It's it's very sweary and yeah, it's uh, it's fun. Anyway, so basically, you remember the for the ones who don't know, so just later. You, you remember Operation, the board game, where you kind of remove organs from the very nice patient? So basically, this is the patient's patient, and this is your hand. In the game, you have to control a very clumsy hand. You are a very clumsy surgeon, and you have to use all of those tools here to break the ribs and do a heart transplant. Simple, right? <laughs> and you can do brain, brain transplant as well. And when I looked at that game in the morning, I was like, oh my god, who's going to play that? That's horrible, that's horrible. And at the end of that day, our, our servers went down, like massively down. Everyone was like trying to play the game and no game anymore. And we rapidly put on Congregate, which is a, another, another uh, very, very good, uh, well, at the time, it was a very good kind of uh, uh, portal for games online. And then that was the first day, the first week. At the end of the first week, we actually had probably dozens of the biggest YouTubers playing Surgeon Simulator and millions of views combined. Like, millions. So we were like, like, in one week we had millions of people watching people playing Surgeon Simulator. And it, it was like a transformative moment in the company, right, as you guys can imagine. We were all like, okay, how can we go into overdrive? How can we, you know, change everything? Like, urgent meeting, let's just go into a room and decide what we're going to do with this IP, because clearly, right, people love that. Um, and <laughs> so Surgeon Simulator was born, and what is interesting is that we created in 2013. It's been five years uh, that we, we launched the first time. Right now, Surgeon is, is on, on mobile, iPad, VR, PlayStation, etc. But if you go right now to YouTube and you search for Surgeon Simulator, you're probably going to find a couple of hundred videos that were posted in the last 24 hours. It, it's that connection, that type of connection that people have with this game. And since then, I mean, it, it, was, it's very, it was very important for us that we kind of... Oh, this is important. Okay, I missed that part. <laughs> so, when that happened, we <coughs> said, how can we make this onto Steam? And Steam had something called Green Lights, which is a voting system, a little bit like Kickstarter, that uh, indie developers would put their games there, and then it would get votes. And the top voted games would get into Steam. And this was Surgeon Simulator, this, this spike here. So we broke the chart. So basically, in five, in five days, we got more votes than the top five items on the list 
got in 30 days. And yeah, there's no, no, no chance we would not do something about this IP, right? And it was very interesting because that taught us a really, really important lesson to be super fast, of course, on making stuff happen and to validate with audiences very quickly. And since then, we, we implemented <coughs> this game jam inside Boston. So every other month, even nowadays, with 75 people, we stop the whole company for two days, long weekends, during the week, uh, and we promote a game jam. And people just jam. They can organize themselves however they want. They can choose their pairs and people who they want to work with. And there are only two rules. One rule is you cannot work on your own. So you have to persuade someone else that your idea is great. Or join someone else. Mm. Um, the second rule I cannot talk about. Uh, actually, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> Uh, so the second rule is basically the, the game needs to be playable at the end of the second day. Because on the following week, usually we do like Thursdays and, Thursday and Fridays, and then on the following week there's a presentation. So you have to go in front of the whole, uh, all the bossians and present your game. And by doing that, we actually uh, arrived in a very important kind of rule of thumb in the way that we, we make our creative machine work which basically we fail 200 times to get to 10 validations to get to four games. And that means that if I count all of the games that we created in the last five years in Game Jams, it was probably around 200. Uh, out of those 10, we did some sort of validation. And what I mean by validation could be that we put a video on YouTube and see how many views we got. Uh, or we can have something playable on the iPad and, and the guys go into the tube and show to people, see how people react to that. Uh, or it could be that we do uh, uh, internal play tests. So we do validations in very different ways. And we <coughs> fail a lot. We mm. fail 200 times and then 10 times to get to the four ones that we believe are going to be successful. And these four games, what happened is that the people who created that in the ground during the game jam, they are fully vested. They really believe in that because they created it. It was not me as a, as a founder saying, hey, you should do this because I believe this game is amazing. They created with their own initiative and their own autonomy. That's a small group of us last year before we became 75. Uh, so so I, we typically say that, it's like it, it gives them pride, autonomy and speed because they know that they might fail but in the process of failing they might find a great feat again and we want that too, right? There you go, that's uh, the community as well, which is so, yes? Are you going to talk about revenue growth and number of subscribers in the surgeon game and in that purchases and things? No, but I can tell you that we, we, we sold uh, Surgeon, we sold uh, around 6 million copies. Well, <coughs> and, uh, but it's a premium game, so we don't do, we don't do uh, enough purchase for Surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot, uh, I am bred, I don't have it on my head, but yeah, I can, I can follow up with you later. Well, I'm just curious. Yeah. So, uh, in the process of making that, of making the games, we also, because we're doing validation, we're connecting to the audiences <coughs> and we're connecting to communities. And they want to either see us succeeding or failing. So we, we canceled a game last year called Deck Splash. That was all about skate, etc., cetera, uh, skateboard. And um, we canceled because at some point, the people who were creating the game, they did not believe in the game so much anymore. But also, uh, we did a second validation with the audience, and they did not uh, say yes to that. So we're like, okay, that's the reality of things. It's really tough, it's a failure, but we have to move on and dedicate time to things we believe are gonna succeed. <coughs> and I think that brings me back to reinvention, right? So, if you ask me, are we, are we happy with that? Are we succeeding revenue-wise? Yes. <laughs> uh, so we are in a very, very different situation where we were in the darkest times. Um, are we happy with this process? No. We want better. 
we want better process we want to keep reinventing that keep improving that can we do better with the game jams can we change the themes can we do prototypes can we get all the studios involved in that it's like we're always asking this question how do we improve this process of creating games uh, and I think above all we, we want to kind of make sure that we create a, a legacy you know we want to probably be better bigger than Beatles <laughs> if we can be bigger than the Beatles that would be amazing right so and we want to create uh, games that in 10 years time, 20 years time, people look back and say, wow, I remember that time that that game was launched and how much I enjoyed playing that and how much I enjoyed playing with others as well, with my friends. Uh, just like, you know, the, when you go to your favorite artist to see them in a music festival, you want them to sing the old songs, right? Because the old songs are the ones that connect to your heart in a, in a different manner. But we want also to keep creating things that are daring and that are new and they're revolutionary because that's what we believe that the audience will, are expecting from us. Um, yeah, so we want to give this to them. That's it. Thank you very Thank much, you. Roberta. So we're going to do a Q&A session. Um, and I guess I'll kick off with a question. So I don't need the mic. Can you hear me at the back, yeah? Yes. Good. My first question was going to be about, obviously, Roberta, you've been very successful in a very short space of time. Can I say how much you've raised in Series A? It's public yeah. knowledge. Yeah, so probably, you raised yeah. like 20 million. 10, 10 million dollars. 10 million yeah. dollars. And uh, you've gone from... 20 people to 70 people and you've won a BAFTA and so on and, and there's a long string of accolades here in a very short space of time. And I think for a CXO audience, everyone here probably has their own team. There may be constraints on how they run the team processes and how they recruit. And I think there was something we spoke about before about your team and the diversity of your team and how important is that yeah. to, to Bossa? Uh, that'd be my, is that a question? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it is. Um, so I'm one of those probably rare women in games. <laughs> um, we are a total of 23% of the workforce, uh, not at Bossa, but kind of globally games, games companies. Uh, if I look at developers, women developers in games, it's, it's one digit percent but across the board, 23%. And it, it's interesting that the audiences nowadays, people who play games, actually is 50-50. So you have 50-50 men and women playing games, regardless of the genre and whether it's casual or hardcore. So for us, um, since the beginning of Bossa, I was very conscious about bringing the right level of talent to the company but also changing the unconscious bias. And I believe that by doing that, we naturally create games and products and campaigns that are way more um, appealing to wider people and to everyone in the world. So the UK is not our, our, our top selling uh, country. It, it's, it's, we actually have a very, a very kind of granular, fragmented top, top 10 uh, countries in the world who, who buy our games from. And so diversity of, of, of gender is so important because you bring this different perspective. Uh, it's important also because people see the, that games is not exclusive. It's not like, oh my God, that's a boys club. I'm not going to belong to that, right? Uh, and so having someone like me you know, like as in the founding team is very important, but also in our CXO group, we are seven in total, counting myself and three of them are women, so four and three. And that is deliberate. We don't hire for the gender, of course not. We hire the best person for the job, but we do make an extra effort to get everything balanced. Okay. So I think it's well documented that diverse teams are more creative, more efficient, just generally outperform yeah. teams that are more uniform. Uh, in the short, medium, and long term, um, is there anything else that like that diversity brings? Are there statistics like 
at CXO level, at manager level, at developer level, or across the workplace around the diversity that you know. Yeah, there's a the statistic uh, uh, statistics shared by I believe it was Sherry Kutu and the Scale Up uh, report recently. That let me see if I can remember exactly the numbers, but. <laughs> Uh, companies that have uh, women as part of the leadership in the startup scale up uh, segment, they usually make uh, double the revenues than the ones who don't. So <coughs> it's quite it's impressive. Not, it's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad, yeah. So, so it's, 100%. It's, I, yeah, I, I was not expecting that at all. Right, right. But I, 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 it's just a direct impact on how you make decisions, right? Yeah. It's just a little bit more balanced. We, and naturally, I mean, I'm, I'm a very risk, risk taker kind of profile. Um, and I'm going to make a massive generalization now, right? But generally, gen, generally the, the women are a little bit less risk takers and men are a little bit more. So I think the combination works. Uh, interesting. <laughs> I think Sarah Wood last year said some similar things about the <coughs> diversity of her workforce and yeah. I think it was an important point then and just kind of reinforcing it again after mm -hmm. chatting to you and uh, see it's been said to. Um, any questions? Oh, we got quite a few so awesome. our glamorous assistant will come around with a mic. <coughs> I, I want to. I want to, to. Sorry, just to to uh, add to the whole question thing. I went to talk to some uh, kids uh, between twelve to fifteen the other day in a school, and it, I had prepared. I had one hour, and I prepared. I don't know, forty minutes of talk, and then halfway through, I saw they were like, "We need to need to ask things," <laughs> and it was a short and everything because they they wanted to ask so many questions. So I'm glad that you guys <laughs> are really raising your hands. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I hope that wasn't. <laughs> it is. I was 15 year olds. <laughs> no, no, that was not. <laughs> I, I, I might have dropped you there. No. Been, uh, <laughs> that did look pretty long, I guess. Um, but anyway, my question is obviously, influencer marketing is a big thing for you guys with gaming mm -hmm. and obviously with YouTube. Have you had any situations where you've had to deal with publicity around certain YouTubers? How have you managed that going forward and how have you ensured that? the brand is stable in a positive light and what kind of impact has that had on, mm. on their yourselves? That's a very good question, especially with PewDiePie, right? Yeah. So we okay, there's one one thing that we've never done and we're very proud of that, we've never paid any YouTuber or any influencer to play our games. No uh, Twitchers, no YouTubers, no journalists, no one to kind of play and review our games. We never did that. Because we always wanted them to pick it up and, and to be something genuine, that they actually enjoy that and then they, they share with their audience. Now, it's funny because, weirdly enough, we never had to deal with something of a big backlash from, from YouTubers. And, and I think because they do the nature of what they do, which is mainly just less play, right? It's just playing the game. Um, there was never a time that they did something weird or wrong with the, the games that actually made it worse for us. But what we do is we track a lot of things, uh, including attribution, right? So it, it's a little bit implied because you cannot you cannot get the, the right super you know accurate attribution from each each uh, YouTuber or each video or each uh, whatever. So. But we know the ones who actually convert into better sales. And so we actually, over the time, became a little bit clever on the ones that we reach. <coughs> we push a little bit more to, <laughs> to do more Let's Play uh, than others. And, and as you can imagine, you know, uh, guys like PewDiePie, and etc., they appear entertainment. So sometimes people are watching them because it's them, not because of the game. So we need to be careful with that. So influencing market, influencer marketing is super, super key for us, yeah. Hi, I've got two questions. First one, um, you mentioned how you got the award for the BAFTA. And the judges for the BAFTA obviously like to monster, monster, monster. The market doesn't have the same view. Have you any theories about why there's a disconnect there? Yeah, so the game had some really uh, big issues with retention. 
So the it was most of mine different to surgeon was uh, with in-app purchase. So you played for free and then you paid for virtual goods inside the game. And we did not crack the retention right. So despite us having a good conversion of players to payers, people were just not staying long enough in the game. They were dropping after, just, just so you know a little bit about the game. So the game is, uh, you, you, have, uh, you, have, you control B-movie type of monsters and you destroy your friend's city. And they do the same thing back to you. So by the nature of the game, every time that you would go back to the game, your city would be destroyed by your friends. <laughs> so, and that's like just gameplay. That was the way that the game was designed. And so some people, you know, more people than we thought, got not so, so amazingly rewarded experiences every time they came back to the game. So our retention levels was like, Ooh. so yeah, so it just did not make money. The second question is, um, you mentioned how you went away to the games fest for a couple of days, and then you came back and you sat there <coughs> and you saw Surgeon. And that gives the impression that the Surgeon was written in a couple of days. Is that the right impression? Yeah, it was made in, couple, in two days. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so exactly. You must, you must make a lot of games, perhaps, have a high turnover, and then using your filter system to figure out which ones are going to retain the market. Presence. Yeah, so, okay, first playable was made in two days. Uh, after we went through the green light and we got, okay, seems like, you know, there's a massive platform like Steam that would support us in everything we do. Now let's invest another four months into the game. So that was January and then we launched, like properly launched the game uh, at the end of April. Again, super fast, right? Considering that it was a full game. Uh, so that, so the, I, I think the key thing of how we make games is that we are able to create a small playable version that is the representation of how fun you're going to have with the game. And then that we can test very early on, literally after two days. And then we can say, okay, that has legs, it's fun enough, people are laughing or people are playing, whatever, let's invest another X amount of time to get into shape to monetize, to be in the right platform, to be bug free. It was very buggy <laughs> after two days. So, so yeah, so I think that's what we mastered to create something tiny that represents the fun of the game. <clears throat> I'm just going to chip in. Yeah. Sorry, I tend to talk a bit. But one of the things when I first, when we chatted uh, for this uh, event, was a lot of I think the CXOs in this room have gone through different software engineering processes from Waterfall to Agile and one of the things speaking to Roberta about this process it was like Agile on steroids. Exactly. It was like you get the whole cliche about fail soon, fail early, do a lot of user testing and drill down and then find what works with the user and your process was like hyper accelerated through that. That was why I thought it'd be really interesting for the CXO audience to see and this has really been working yeah. in practice. It has been working so we did that same thing with Iron Bread so uh, usually what we do in the game jams uh, people can organize themselves and etc but we usually give them a theme so because Surgeon was such a big thing for us we we're like okay can we create <laughs> another clump simulator um, out of another idea so one of the game jams we did, which is where Iron Bread came from, uh, was, was a clump simulator. And then we said, okay, this is a theme. And people went there and they created a piece of bread, which is mission is to be toasted. <laughs> That's where the game is. <laughs> so you like a little piece of bread and then you walk around in the kitchen and then it's like you avoid the, the butter, you avoid the jam until you get to the toast and then you toast it. Yay, you win, right? So, um, so we managed to create that very short amount of time. Then our, we decided to validate via just a very simple gameplay of uh, a video of the gameplay we put on YouTube in our channel. We didn't even talk to so many 
uh, influencers at the time. And we're like, okay, can we get at least 100,000 views on that without doing much, just organically, uh, within a week? Yeah, we got it. So we're like, okay, next stage now, how long is gonna take for us to take this piece of bread walking around the kitchen into something that is hours of play for people? And then I think we invested another two months into, into the game with a team of probably I am bread was probably a team of six people uh, during during two months and then we did another validation We're like okay is it good enough and then we invited a bunch of people to do play tests inside the company uh, and then that's the point that we went to the tube and we like we put on the iPad and said okay would anyone in the tube be able to play there and laugh and yeah thumbs up another four months of investment and then we launched on early access, which is a which is a method on Steam right now that you can already monetize even though the game is still <coughs> in development. So we do very very phased, making sure that we 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 are financially successful <laughs> before the, the disaster. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna just ask a completely not entirely but slightly different tack this morning. One of the presentations was about the future of Drupal, <coughs> future of tech, mm -hmm. and one of the key paths or scenarios or just futures was around AI. Mm -hmm. And I know you're doing something with yeah. AI. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that platform? Can you talk about that? Platform? Yeah, yeah, I can talk a little bit. Yes, we uh, we have not announced yet uh, officially our. Uh, next game so right now we fully focus on worlds adrift and worlds adrift is a, is a is a big mmo a different take on mmo which um some magazines edge magazine oh it was here somewhere edge magazine said that it's the the minecraft for the next generation which is no pressure uh, <laughs> so it's a it's a yeah so yeah the minecraft for the new generation <laughs> uh, so yeah so that's our focus right now, not AI, but it's Improbable. So I don't know if you guys heard of Improbable. It's, uh, it's a company created by some uh, grads from uh, Cambridge University, and their idea is to create a whole new virtual world where simulations happen on an ongoing basis on, in real time. So we're using that technology to make this big, big game. Uh, and then this, the, the next one, which we're probably going to launch in about two years time or so, um, is the one that we're exploring in AI. So we hired a guy uh, called Chad Falzek, who is actually, he was the writer of Half-Life 2 and um, Team Fortress, no, it's, it's the other one. He worked at Valve for 12 years, basically, so he's a really, really top guy and he's fascinated about AI and storytelling. So he's uh, helping us to create a very awesome game that it's all on Can top of AI. Can you say a bit more about AI? <laughs> I, can't, I can't push you on that one. Yeah, it's, uh, so, so we, we are, we're still building, it's very early stage right yeah. now, but our vision, our, 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 our assumption is that there must be a way for us to use deep tech in AI to create storytelling uh, in a way that it's scalable. So that basically the process of creating the game becomes even more optimized than we're doing right now, but also the stories are much more relevant because the machine is learning from the players, but also from the machines inside the game. That's so, all I can say. <laughs> that's all you can say. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll turn very, that one very, off. Very, very cryptic, but yeah. Did you want to show the video of the surgeon on YouTube? Or? Let's see if I can. Yeah, I'll let you find. And let, has anyone got uh, any other? Oh, there's, you got a question. Okay. okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Congratulations on the surgeon. Yes. Um, I was just thinking that maybe that got quite a lot of sales before and what have you and puberty, obviously, being what he is. But I've made a, um, an educational game about math for kids. And I'm just wondering how, like how would you market that, basically? Mm -hmm. No blood, no fraud, just all family fun and entertainment stuff. How do you make that sell in this day and age? 
Yeah, that's the thing. It's like there's a there's a there's a, a perception that just because it's easy for you to reach people in social media nowadays, then then it's easy, right? You just put it out there, people will discover. It's a massive misconception because we ju just for you to have an idea right now, uh, out of 75 people, 10 people work in marketing, community, and PR at Bossa. And we always kept a very good ratio between marketing and game development. And so we're very deliberate. So we, we, we talk to, it, to uh, uh, influencers, but we also do a lot of PR. A lot of PR is so, so important, especially for games, because you know having, having those guys, Edge Magazine and, uh, and others saying, IGN saying, this is good. Uh, actually create much more SEO for you and for your website as well. But also we build over the time uh, a very good relationship with Steam, with Valve. So they, as, as a platform, they always help us to feature our games when we launch it. So it's a, I would say it's a three-way thing. We do very, very little of customer acquisition paid, but we do influence marketing, we do a lot of PR, and we do a lot of uh, relationship with platforms. I can tell you one thing as well, it's like, for us to launch on PC first, PC Mac first, is very crucial, because when you, when you try to market your game on the App Store, unless you get like an amazing feature from Apple, it's, you're gonna be like, it's gonna be hard work, you're gonna be buried in like, so like zillions of apps that are launched every day, right? So, so it's very deliberate we start on PC because we can get the maximum exposure. Did that answer your question? You basically talked to me about the PC, not that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your game is on mobile? iOS, yeah. iOS, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So try, try to get, get in contact with Apple to see if, uh, and build a relationship. Nowadays we have a relationship with Apple as well, but it's something that it took us a while to, until we got there. And the way all platforms work, Apple and, and all the others, is you want to share with them as early as possible the game that you're creating and the proper marketing plan. We usually have like a, a, a full 20 slides, very traditional, this is how we're going to launch the game, and we seed this to all the platform holders so they know what we're all about. Okay, okay. let's see. Let's see if that works. I'm not sure the audio, so you might have to yeah, put up the audio. Uh, I'm not sure see. that's... Uh, Maybe... Uh, so many. Uh, check this out, Six, 61 million views. I'm not sure if that was the first one. Maybe it was. <laughs> How's it going? My name is Brady. And welcome to Simulator 2013. Thank you. 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 Thank Hey, what's going on here? Hey, what's your name? Oh, let me just touch it. Oh, don't worry, Rupert. You're in good hands. <laughs> You're in good hands, Rupert. Smell my hand. Smell it, Ruben. Jeez, it smells like finger, Ruben. <laughs> my hand is a fucking helicopter. What about that? All right. The surgery shall begin. Let me cover your ugly face, Ruben. Jeez, you're ugly. There we go. Actually, I can't have this. There we go. Perfect. Get to out of my space. I'm a sick. I'm a son. You're not a fucking moron. There we go. Super buggy, right? <laughs> As well. Now let's pick <laughs> which of these tools. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> no, no, no. Alright, let me see. It's so fucking hard to grab stuff. Seriously. <laughs> Get away, glass tube. I don't need you. I want this saw and I shall have it. Alright, Robert. This might hurt a little bit. Don't worry about it. It's a little. Uh, we gotta get rid of the ribs. Oh god. Yes. Oh god. No. It's just his lungs. <laughs> it won't need them very long anyway. 
This oh god no was one of our designers who created a voiceover. Oh god no. That's pretty oh chat, chat, chat! Yes. The lungs, um, I'll put you over here, alright? Don't do anything stupid, Lung. I'm watching. Lung, where are you going? Lung, what did I tell you, Lung? God damn it, Lungs, you can never trust them. Son of a bitch. Stupid ribs, get out of my way! I'm doing serious surgery here. Fucking hell, man. God! Ah, well, it looks like we'll have to use brutal force on you, Rebecca. It would seem that you would not cooperate. Oh, there we go. Perfect, perfect, perfect. There we go. I didn't do this, Robert. You did. Bah. Ah. Oh, shit. Shit. <laughs> it wasn't me. I swear to God. All right, let's give this another go. All right, here we are. Perform the trust match. Shut up. That's pretty good. That we might actually get to the heart. Yes! Alright. He lost a lot of blood. We must be cautious from this point. He's bleeding! He's gonna bleed to death, Dr. Pence! There you go. <laughs> you can watch more there. <laughs>